Hey guys, I'm Adam Haig from 3D Games and in this video I'll be showing you how to make awesome looking ruins for your tabletop wargaming using simple steps. This will be the first of a series of videos in which I build terrain in preparation for the upcoming Battle of Osgiliath box set. So make sure to hit that subscribe button and hit the bell so that you don't miss any of my future releases. And as always, if you appreciate this content, then please hit like and drop a comment below. I really appreciate it. It helps me with my motivation. Now these ruins were made specifically for Middle Earth Strategy Battle Game themed around the city of Osgiliath. The same techniques can be transferred for any fantasy setting. The ruined city of Osgiliath is an iconic location in Tolkien's Middle-earth and an excellent battlefield to fight over. The old ruins of Middle-earth set has recently been re-released, although as per usual the price hike is crazy, especially for us poor folks down in Middle-earth. Thankfully I already had a set that I'd assembled and primed with Army Painter's skeleton bone years ago when it was first released. Firstly arrange the ruins into a configuration that you like, and then draw your boundary. This is where you will cut. Be sure to leave yourself space for a tapered edge and any debris that you want to include. The MDF I used for this is 4.75mm thick and is very easy to cut with a jigsaw. Next taper off the edges with a sharp retractable blade making sure to cut away from you. This will help blend the ruins into your board more naturally. I then went ahead and painted the base, then decided to texture it instead, making this step redundant. To do this, spread polyfiller in a thin and even coat over the entire top of the base. Use a spatula to make it smooth and an even thickness. Mine was roughly 2mm thick. You can wait for this to dry, then scratch in a stone pattern, but it's a lot faster using a textured roller like this. I used the pavement texture rolling pin from Green Stuff World. Leave it for 24 hours or until completely dry, then it's ready for painting. I wasn't happy with how it looked on my first painting attempt because it didn't match the colour scheme for my ruins. So I sprayed the pavement texture with the Army Painter's Skeleton Bone. I then overbrushed the whole area with a light grey colour, followed by a dry brush of white. This really helps to bring out the texture of the floor. To help add realism, use highly watered down paint or inks to create a weathered and stained look. I used black and burnt umber for this. Now it's time to paint the ruins themselves. I found it easier to paint these separately before gluing them to the base, but this did come with its own issue as you'll see later in the video. Start by heavily dry brushing the ruins with a light grey colour. Work thoroughly over all the surfaces of the stonework, brushing from all angles to make all those raised details stand out. It's easy to miss patches, particularly in the archways and windows, so try to be methodical and check over each piece before you move to the next step. Next dry brush again, this time with white and in a downwards motion. The aim of the game here is to simulate the way sunlight would naturally hit the upper portions of the ruins and the raised surfaces in a downwards direction. This step should really help accentuate the edges of the ruins and help the details pop. Now it's time to get messy. Use washes, highly watered down paints or inks to create a weathered finish. Load your brush, then dab the paint onto the ruins letting it run down the surface. Doing this all over the ruins will help to create more depth in the recesses and give the details more definition. This part is also where what used to be plastic starts to turn to stone as if by magic. The wooden planks were then painted with Citadel Wildwood Contrast Paint. I thinned it down with some contrast medium so that the raised details of the wood grain would stand out as a lighter colour. The next step will really bring these ruins to life. Using Citadel Athonian Camo Shade, paint a few random areas where you would imagine algae and moss might grow. Certain recesses and cracks 
on the corners of ledges and steps. Don't go crazy with this, just a few here and there will create the desired effect. Now that the ruins are painted, it's time for the fun part. Blue stuff. Heat it up in boiling water. You could speed this up by putting it in the microwave for 30 seconds, just make sure it's in water. Once it's soft and pliable, it's ready to use. Remember that you're working with boiling water here and it burns. Probably a good idea to wear gloves. Tear off blobs of blue stuff to use and mush it down into the details you're wanting to clone. It generally works best by working it into the deeper recesses first, then working your way out from there. With the second statue I simply pressed it firmly into a blob of blue stuff, then pressed in the edges. It actually worked really well and was a lot simpler. Next it's time to clone some stone arches. This time I learnt my lesson and actually wore gloves. Gather a great big blob in an oven tray and squish it down flat. Then press the sections of ruins firmly down into the blue stuff. We will be pouring casting plaster into this mould later, so you want to make sure all the edges are raised to avoid plaster running out everywhere. Putting the moulds into the fridge will help to cool them faster so they're ready to use. Then simply peel the blue stuff moulds off and see how well they worked. My statue moulds had a great big gap at the bottom so I used some blue tack to plug them up for casting. Time to pour some plaster. This is much the same as using rock moulds which you can check out by clicking the card in the top right corner. Mix your casting plaster as per the instructions. I mix 250 grams of plaster with 150 mils of water. Before pouring in the plaster it's a good idea to spray some soapy water over your moulds. This will help make it easier to separate the plaster from the mould later. To make some general rubble, pour any leftover plaster into an oven tray and smooth it out to an even thickness. This should only take a couple of hours to set and then you can pop out your casts. Carefully peel away your mould, working slowly to avoid breaking anything. As you can see here, the plaster spilled into the archways, which then needed to be carefully broken off the main shape. Take time to carefully clean up the edges to get rid of any mould lines. Carefully pop out the statues. You can see here how well the blue stuff catches those details. Pop the plaster out of the oven tray onto a firm surface. Then use a hammer to smash it into bits. Keep smashing until you achieve the scale you want for your rubble. It's good to have a variety of shapes and sizes to use. Now it's finally time to stick the ruins to the base. To do this I use super glue along the bottom edges with a couple of blobs of hot glue. The hot glue holds the ruins in place while the super glue will create a solid bond. I changed my mind with the statue location because I wanted more room for a collapsed statue. To create this I used one of the plaster car statues and fixed the pieces to the base with PVA surrounded by some pieces of rubble. More piles of rubble were added by using PVA and scattering the broken bits of plaster. I wanted to create the impression that the corner section of the archways of this ruin have collapsed. To do this I used the plaster cast archways that I broke into chunks and glued them into place. To create further texture, sprinkle coarse sand around the areas of rubble. Adding chunks of plaster to the upper floor will help tie it all into the overall look. I also wanted to create a means for soldiers to clamber up to the second floor, so I used a broken section of archway. This was glued into place with the hot glue gun. 
I then apply generous amounts of super glue to the larger chunks of plaster to fix them in place securely. To colour the plaster ruins I use the leopard spot technique applying spots of burnt umber and ochre followed by a wash of black. These colours were sealed in place by spraying the ruins with matte sealant. This also helps to fix everything in place. I wasn't happy with how this looked and in hindsight should have painted it all together with the plastic ruins. This would have been a lot easier to achieve a consistent look. Finish painting the rubble in the same way as the plastic ruins with a dry brush of light grey followed by white. Once again a Thonian camo shade adds a level of grimy realism. Next apply a mix of tile grout and soil with PVA. See how I make this mix by clicking the card in the top right. Place this all around the edges of the base and around sections of rubble. This creates a lovely realistic looking ground cover and helps blend the base of your ruins into your gaming board. You could use whatever colour tile grout suits your scheme, for example a light grey coloured grout might work to really blend with your rubble. Use an old paintbrush to brush the tile grout mix off the sections of rubble so it doesn't obscure the details. Go over key areas, sprinkling coarse sand, little bits of gravel, and here I use Geek Gaming's City Rubble Base Ready. This helps to add further texture. Next, seal everything in place by spraying all the ground cover with isopropyl alcohol followed by a spray of matte sealant. The alcohol allows the sealant to penetrate all those layers of aggregates rather than just forming a film over the top layer. After leaving the ruins to dry, it's time to start adding some details. I didn't like this section of the walls. It looks like it's meant to be a joining section and the stone pattern randomly ending like that looks stupid. So I decided to cover it up with some dead foliage. The perfect solution? JTT dry vines. Or you could use any fibrous material that gives the impression of a dead or dry climbing plant. These were fixed in place by dabbing small amounts of hobby tack onto key fixed points on the walls. Wait until the glue becomes clear and tacky, then press the fibres into the glue. The hobby tack will hold the foliage in place and can then be fixed firmly with spray of matte sealant. Then stick a bunch of grass tufts to the ground cover. Grass tufts tend to look better when applied in groups. Stick them all around, in between chunks of rubble and the odd couple popping up within the ruins themselves. This will create the impression of nature reclaiming the land of an ancient ruin decayed by the passage of time. And here it is, ready to provide cover for the beleaguered forces of Gondor. Once again, towards the end there I was hit with crippling indecision as I tried to work out whether I wanted to include moss or not. I decided I'd go with the dry look because I felt like it suited the kind of the warm tones that I used, the aesthetic that I used. It has been pointed out to me that it may not fit thematically with the city of Osgiliath being a river city. You would expect um, quite a bit of moisture and, and moss to, to grow, I suppose. Um, the way I get around that is I'm going to say that this is one a, a ruin on the outskirts of the city where it's perhaps a bit more dry. It could even be used uh, as a ruin in Athelion. All in all, I'm really happy with how it turned out, particularly the plaster cast uh, statues and arches. And I'm really excited about continuing with this to try and build an entire Osgiliath themed game board.
Thanks for watching. Good hobbying, guys.